Thank you, Lisa. Um, well, I'm so happy to be here. As Lisa said, I'm a lover of music. Um, there's my mom back there. I grew up listening to her play the piano. Um, she's an amazing um, piano player. And so I, I took flute um, in band. And so it, it's always stuck with me. I really, really enjoy um, music and orchestra. So like Lisa said, I work at Oak Ridge National Lab. So I'm on a Hardin Valley campus not the one um, down the road, but still the same organization. And I work in 3D printing, so it's pretty cool, right? So I do manufacturing research, and 3D printing is actually a really great way to manufacture some stuff. One of the things that we are most well known for is our large-scale 3D printing. Has anyone seen this before? Can you tell what? Yeah, so that, I was about to ask, what, what do you think they're 3D printing? It's actually a car. So this is a car that we um, designed and built with um, local motors. It's a company just down the road. They designed it and printed it. It's called the Strati. So what's printed on this is the black parts with the really texture. And then obviously the other moving pieces like the wheels or the, the steering wheel um, and then the seats and the windshield, those were bolted onto the printed frame. So yeah, so that's what we're most well known um, about. So um, so along the way though, I've had a lot of different experiences and they all started with being hands-on. One of those experiences was on a reality show on the Discovery Channel, this is 2013. Um, you guys may be too young to remember this, but um, it was originally called The Big Brain Theory, or is originally called Top Engineer, okay? I did not apply to a show called The Big Brain Theory, that would be weird. Um, but anyway, so it was an uh, engineering reality competition. It was filmed over seven weeks. There were eight challenges, 10 contestants, and we had to build some ridiculous and amazing things in a very short time. So one of them was a waterfall elevator where they put up a waterfall and we had to use the energy of the water dropping to lift a person three stories high. Um, there was, my favorite was the pancake machine. The challenge was to feed the masses, feed up as many people as you can in an hour. So we made a robotic pancake machine where it made, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pancakes in an hour. So really, really unique experience. So spoiler alert, I got second place in this competition, which was a little disappointing at first, but what was the coolest part about getting second place was that Buzz Aldrin was the guest judge for that last competition. Who knows who Buzz Aldrin is? Yeah. Yeah, who is he? Second man on the moon, good job. That's right. So, You're in good company. Yeah. So, um, being the second man on the moon, he saw that I got second place. And he took me by the shoulders and he said, I know what it's like to live in the shadow of another. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought to myself, oh my gosh, Buzz Aldrin just totally equated me to himself. And so, for that, I'll take second place any day. Yeah. Um, so, in addition to that, I'm on a show right now on Science Channel called Outrageous Acts of Science. It's a fun little clip show where we talk about YouTube videos of people doing stupid stuff in their backyard and they explain the physics of like why did they fall on their face or like how did she make that really cool machine um, and we just it's a bunch of scientists sitting in chairs talking about YouTube videos it's awesome so um, if you watch Science Channel you've probably seen this show they play it a lot. Um, I have a TEDx talk on my experience on big brain theory um, and I wanted to you're, you know, feel free to look into this later. Um, it's on YouTube. And I wanted to add to this talk, um, it focuses on uh, things I learned in the competition, like the power of pure focus and embracing failure. And so I want to add to that by talking to you today about creativity. So what is creativity? Just keep clicking through. Creativity is a lot of things, right? It's really, really hard to grasp. It's idea generation, it's production, it's problem solving, imagination, art, it's science, production, and maybe even some destruction, right? Next slide. Um, yeah, just keep looking through. So, creativity. Generally, we think of creativity as just having an idea. And that is an important part of being creative. But I would argue that it's not really useful to be creative and have ideas if you can't implement them, right? 
So these are kind of my three steps to creating. The first is obviously having the idea. Then you gotta build it, you gotta make it. And then the hard part is failing to success. Next slide. So when we have an idea, they come from lots of different places, right? So you can have inspiration from other work. So maybe you like Beethoven, but you think he needs a little bass there, right? Or he needs like a drum beat. You could do a remix. So that's creativity. Um, experiences that you've had and maybe just some intuition about something to create based on your experience. And then of course, need, right? There's um, most of the ideas that we have, most of the creativity is inspired by a need. Necessity is the mother of invention. The challenge with this phase of creativity and generating ideas is the filtering, right? I don't know about you, but when I start to problem solve and I have lots of ideas, it's really hard to narrow down to the good ones. Um, so one way to do that is to consider your constraints, obviously, time, money, um, but we'll talk a little bit more about filtering. So we're um, discussing carbon fiber violence tonight. It's kind of the feature of tonight. And those didn't just happen overnight. Um, there was a lot of things that aligned to, to make those a reality. But it started with a problem, right? Um, the problem with the wood violins is that they're fragile, right? We all know this if you've ever held a violin. It's like holding like an egg. <laughs> it very, seems very fragile. Because they're made of wood, they're sensitive to humidity. So I know a lot of musicians spend a lot of time caring for their instruments, making sure they're never set out in a car on a hot day in Alabama, right? <laughs> um, the, the hand shaping process, they're, they're very difficult to get violins consistently sounding the same. And then the special wood that they're made from uh, is getting more and more expensive these days, okay? So, so that's kind of a new evolution of, of the field. So um, the advantage of carbon fiber is that it's stiffer, it's more robust, and if there's any experts on this particular topic, feel free to chime in. Um, but from my, my research, um, I also found that it, they actually have better acoustics. It's an engineered material, so you get more consistent um, fabrication. But there's also a critical element to the evolution of the carbon fiber instrument, and that's timing. Carbon fiber is, typical, is used to be really expensive, right? 20 years ago, if you were to think about making anything out of carbon fiber, it would have just been way too expensive. But since then, it's gotten a lot cheaper. Part of the reason for that is the research that's going on just down the road at Oak Ridge National Lab. There's the carbon fiber manufacturing facility where they've cut the cost of carbon fiber down by 60%. So two thirds of the costs have gone down. That's because they use different, what are called precursors or main materials. Sorry, I'm gonna be a little technical right now and then we'll, we'll speed back up. Um, but the carbon fiber was made of some expensive plastic. They just pull it into strings and they bake out all the um, non-carbon elements and that's how you make carbon fiber. Well, instead of using that expensive precursor, they use polyester, which is what your socks are made of, which is way cheap, and that's how they've cut the cost of carbon fiber. So timing. Timing is really, really important in some of these ideas. Next slide. All right, so when you have ideas, you gotta capture them. So this is a little doodle I made over the Christmas break. Um, I was drinking some lemon water and I kept getting lemon seeds stuck in my straw. So I just jotted down, hey, what if you had a little thing, a little bowl, you stick on the end of your straw, so when you're drinking out of it, whether it be a smoothie or you got ice in your glass, that keeps that stuff from getting in your straw and you can have a nice drinking experience. Um, so the, the best part, this is one of my favorite parts about creating is actually doing the doodles. Um, I know we, we doodle when we're in kindergarten and you know maybe through third grade, but, and then we stop, we stop doodling. Um, but it's so important to be able to doodle, right? And be able to draw things clearly. So all I can say is just practice, practice, practice. I have a little notebook that I doodle my ideas in. I have an iPad sometimes I'll doodle in. Um, so if you really want to get good at doodling, if you really want to capture ideas, just, just do it, right? Just doodle it. All right. When you go through the brainstorming process, um, you're going to have a lot of crazy ideas, okay? So this is a solution to a problem that's, that's the real problem, right? Like when you're hungry, but your food's still hot, you want to not, not have to blow on it yourself because, you know, you do that. Um, but this is the kind of thing that comes
comes out of doodling and brainstorming. And to an outsider who doesn't understand the process of creativity, <laughs> something like this would be kind of, you know, a bad idea, right? Um, and maybe it is a bad idea, but these types of ideas, so this is, uh, this is a pretty interesting one, right? It's like, okay, I like to go outside, I like to enjoy, you know, outdoor activities, but my face gets cold, I don't like that, it makes me uncomfortable. Why don't I just put a heater in front of my face? So the problem with that, obviously, is you can't see anything, and your face is probably going to get burned off, but um, anyway, so there's lots of ideas that come out of the generation stage that are probably not that great. Um, but the key to that is to create the good ideas, you have to have the bad. So this little squiggly graph is kind of the classic description of the problem solving process. And the squiggly part is the very beginning. In the very beginning, you just have some kind of vague notion of where you wanna go. And you might go in this direction and think, oh, this is my solution, it might look like this. And you test it a little bit, you think about it, you do some research and you're like, oh, wait, that's a terrible idea. And you go over here, oh, this is a better idea. So you just keep squirming around until eventually you know enough, you've built some intuition, you've understood the problem a little more, you can find it more clearly, and eventually that starts to level out. But like I said, those bad ideas are part of the process. Um, next slide. All right, so we're done with ideas. The next start, uh, part is building or making. So this is the part where you need to have some skills. This is why you're all in school, and you're gonna stay in school, right? Um, so for my field of study, I needed to study some metallurgy, I needed to study engineering, um, and then sometimes, actually more often than not, I need to go find somebody with the skills that I don't have. And that's the best part about working at Oak Ridge National Lab is because honestly, there's an expert in anything that you ever wanted to know. <laughs> there's so many different topics that are studied at Oak Ridge, and I can always find an expert in that field. Somebody who like invented that or like wrote the book on it. So, um, so once you find the skills of people you need to help you, um, this is the next part: you prototype, fail, and repeat. So the whole time, though, you have to be creative. That's that's kind of the main overarching thing. Okay, so the carbon fiber violin building phase. So this is a very gorgeous piece of work, isn't it? So pretty, I don't even wanna to touch it, I don't wanna break it. Um, and it looks so simple and elegant, you kind of, you know, you might just look at it and say like, oh, that's easy, that's obvious. But it actually probably wasn't that obvious at the time. Um, and there was a lot of work to make it, to make it happen. So, this is just, um, I pulled up a research paper from the NERD <laughs> on how they developed this, and there's a lot of different steps that had to go through. So there's a hybrid violin where they just made the top of a violin and glued it onto a, a wind violin to see kind of how it was gonna behave. There's all these different molding processes. This um, picture on the top right here is where they've actually put um, the carbon fiber cut out on top of like a speaker, and they put sand on top, and make the speaker vibrate the, the, the layer, and that will tell you something about the resonance. So there's a lot, a lot of stuff that had to happen to make this work. They had to figure out how many layers of carbon fiber, what kind of glue, how much glue, lots and lots of research and development. So um, sometimes though, the building phase is a filter for your ideas. So this is a project that I had recently that did not work out. <laughs> we were trying to make like a really cool drill bit for like mining, and this is tungsten carbide, and we thought, oh, we'll just 3D print this thing, we'll stick it in the furnace, we'll infiltrate it with this other material, it'll be great. Didn't work out. No matter how hard we tried, it didn't work out. So, but this has pointed us to a key thing that we didn't know before. So, we didn't know that, well, I'm not gonna get into that. Anyway, so we learned a lot from this. <laughs> I don't wanna worry guys too much. I can definitely dive deep if I don't watch myself, so. Um, all right, next slide. Okay, so step three, failing to success. So that's kind of what we were talking about before. Um, so most prototypes, they don't work on the first round, right? Or maybe they work a little bit, but they don't work that great. Um, so failure is definitely necessary. So what's my favorite examples of failing are walk-in robots. So let's play that video. Okay, I love walk-in robots. Let's watch this guy. Now everything doesn't go exactly the way it's supposed to. <laughs> that was a dumpster fire, right? Okay, so, but I'm sure they learned a lot from that test, right? They learned, you know, a little bit more about the robot dynamics, like how much it can 
can't see, like the little shelf beside it, probably couldn't see that. Things they needed to fix. So um, I actually have some friends that worked at this company, Boston Dynamics, and I've kind of been keeping up with the progress. And so um, this next video is their more recent development, which is pretty amazing. No, just wait. Look at this. <laughs> that's terrifying, right? I mean, that's like yeah. the Terminator right here. Um, but anyway, so this is where they got to, right? And they couldn't have gotten there without. I'll just let you guys watch this video for a little bit. trade show that we were trying to debut at. And we were acting like, oh yeah, we know how to do this, it's cool, and it's secretly like, I can't believe this is working, so. Um, anyway, so yeah, back to our squiggly graph. The squiggly graph is just a bunch of fails. Um, and even when it starts leveling off, you're still failing. So it's important, obviously, to embrace failure. Next slide. Um, and imagine what, a world, what the world would be like without failure. So who knows who this is? Thomas Edison, good job. So you did what? Invented the long-lasting electric light bulb. Thank you. That is so so astute. Thomas Edison did not invent electric light, right? He only invented the light bulb that wouldn't burn itself out in like 10 hours, right? So like before that, you'd have to replace your little electric filament very often, like every day. Um, so <laughs> Thomas Edison. <laughs> Thomas Edison um, has given uh, one of my favorite quotes, and he actually tried 10,000 different filaments before finding the one that worked. So his quote is, I haven't failed, I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. So I love that outlook on failure. Um, and then actually another part of that quote that most people don't quote is um, another one of my favorites, and it says, many of life's failures are people who did not realize how close they were to success slide. So failure is practicing for success. Um, when you're being creative, we want to think of the three steps. You have an idea, you make it, and you fail to success. And I'm going to leave you with this final thought. Creating is challenging, but it's so worth it. Um, there is kind of a secret. There is one secret. This is, my, this is one of my secrets that I like to share. The secret is to believe in your crazy idea, okay? Um, I know that sounds super cheesy, like everyone's always told you growing up, believe in, you know, believe in yourself and all this stuff. But that's the truth. That's, that is the truth. If you don't believe that you can get to the finish line, that you can get to the end of that squiggly design graph, you're not going to make it. You have to honestly believe. Some of the, um, some of the most prolific inventors that I know are kind of a little crazy. They believe in things that I would never, ever think would be possible. But they just, they just have so much passion, so much vision and belief that they can get through all those challenges and get through the squiggly graph and get to the end just because they believe so much. Um, and then last slide. Um, the final secret to success in creating is believing in yourself. So maybe right now you don't have all the skills that you need to be a true creator, to create the things that you want to. But you have to believe that someday you will. Someday you have enough experience, 
you will listen to enough music that you will understand what good composure is, right? What a good song sounds like. You're going to be playing in band, you're going to be reading notes on a page, and you'll understand, okay, these notes sound good together, these rhythms sound good with these notes. And one day, you're going to put all of that together, and you can be a creator of music, or you can be a creator of science and technology. You just have to believe in yourself. So that's all I had tonight. Um, thank you so much for coming. I want you to go home and doodle an idea or doodle, doodle a song down, um, and don't stop me. surface on the car, would you have to grind that off and would that, to make the thing smooth, I, I realize you want to leave it there so you show what the process mm -hmm. is, but for a commercial product, yes. would you have to fill it in or would you grind it off? So it's both, yeah, so that's a very good question. Um, so we actually, the main application for this is printing tooling, like for fiberglass or even carbon fiber layups, you print it, um, but that has to be Surface. So we have a CNC subtractive manufacturing machine um, where it actually will machine down that surface nice and smooth and then we do have a coating that kind of glosses it down and makes it um, the smoothness that we need. So it's a good question. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, yes mom. <laughs> Recycle the failures. So yeah, um, definitely with the metals we do, um, we send them off to the scrap and they get recycled. Um, plastics, the economics aren't there. The plastic feedstock that we use is so cheap, it's actually just cheaper to um, buy, buy new material. But we are moving towards um, bio-derived materials so that we, we do have scrap, which we have a lot of right now because it's research. We can bury it, it'll decompose in a couple decades and then you know we don't have to fill up the landfill with it. But. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Thanks, Mom. Yes. From beginning to end, how long did it take to develop this carbon fiber vial? The carbon fiber vial, that's a good question. You know, I haven't been involved in that. Um, so I couldn't I couldn't answer that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can look at for you. Is that a half of a one there? On the table? Uh, seven o'clock, we'll probably get that in. Oh, yeah, the seven o'clock talk will, yeah. Excuse me. Great. One more question. No? Okay. I wanted to just say that I was in the back sort of whispering with some of my musician friends back there, and we were saying, you know, how similar it is the process of science compared to music. And we were saying, as a violinist, I know certainly 10,000 ways not to play the <laughs> bronze <laughs> web and concerto. I got them all down. So <laughs> it's just kind of interesting, all those different things that, that parallel with science and music, so. So Lisa, have you ever played the carbon fiber violin? Yeah, um, I have just very briefly. Really? Um, and I happen to love them. I, yeah. It's a totally different feel and different sound. Ooh. I own a carbon fiber bow, ah. and I use it often, particularly in places where <coughs> I'm worried that my good 
wooden bow might be negatively impacted, like if I'm playing someplace with a low ceiling, oh. <laughs> for example, or many times outside even, I know obviously the hair will be impacted negatively if you have a lot of humidity regardless. But there's something about, <coughs> excuse me, if, I mean, just having the wood in places, like you said, you don't want it in the trunk of your car for a couple of hours or something, because it can very negatively impact. Um, and there are certainly, <coughs> I had a, a friend growing up who had her cello stolen, and it was put in a very damp environment for a couple of months, and it was, oh, there's no, no way to come back from that. So Did you see Chuck? these instruments are kind of unique, and we want to give you a chance to come up and try them. Our um, violist from the Oak Ridge Symphony, Susan Shore, will be up here to help you to hold them and try them if you'd like. There's special shoulder pads that go with them. We want you to maybe do some comparison. And look, here's um, a dissected cello that uh, Dan Alcott actually sent me the video of it being sliced open. Oh. And I just couldn't stand the thought of putting it online. It just hurt me so bad. To see it. So I didn't put it online, but if anybody wants to see it, I have it. But there it is. You can look inside and see exactly all the different components that go into the wooden version. And this here, the sound post, we need to be very careful that it doesn't fall out because it's not under the tension that it would be under if there were strings on it. So it, it, can be a little shaky. But before we get to that, um, we have two gifts to give away this evening. Hey Lisa, I'm not yes. sure if I'm just like got a chance no. in the basket. Well, you not know. everyone. <gasps> okay. Well, sorry, I'm sorry, I just threw it there. If you want to fill your name out and put it in, and we can take more questions or talk more. So, yep. so I've never seen anybody look at this before. Mm -hmm. How is it the exact same? <laughs> Does it just melt the metal and spit it out? So actually, there are seven different ways to 3D print something. Um, metal is about four or five of those. The, um, there's, uh, the most well-known is a powder bed where you spread a layer of powder, metal powder, and you weld it into the layer of the shape, or uh, the shape of the layer. You drop it, more powder, more welding. My process, you still use powder, you spread it into a layer, but use an inkjet print head to deposit a glue into the so you're gluing this thing up like a piece of pottery, you take it out, and then you fire it like a piece of pottery. So you put it in a furnace, and it centers down into metal. Or you can back infiltrate. Um, so there's that, or you can take like a MIG welder on a robot arm and add layers that way. Um, there's actually quite a few different ways to do it. Um, but yeah, it's a good question. And you can visit the MDS facility yeah. and mm -hmm. tour it. There are tours, yeah. Um, we got kind of busy with tours, but yeah, so sometimes the timing is right. And we can oh, get so where is that? That's it's on Hard Valley. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's Hard Valley Road off of Mississippi. If you take the exit, um, take the left, and it's just right there. It's big into our C building. Do we have to make special arrangements to do that? Yeah. So um, there is kind of a tour season. Like sometimes they're better than others, and 